ladies. Oh, that was good. Look at me commanding the room, <laughs> Howard. How y'all doing this afternoon? So here's what we're gonna do. Don't close the back doors yet. Don't close the door, you're closing the door. Don't close it yet. I need for everyone that didn't come to this session to know they made a bad judgment error. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. So on three, we're gonna bust out laughing, screaming really, really loudly. Hold, I said on three, follow directions, people. Ready? One, two, three. Y'all need to make better decisions next time. <laughs> so this today, lady, we're talking about leadership development. How do you begin to develop yourself as a leader? So how many of you were here last year? Do you remember the Own the Room with Your Voice session? So that was me, so we're gonna stand up. Stand up. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to say our time, our way, our power. Our power. And if you were in last year's session, you already know you need to drop that voice a little bit, mm -hmm. get, get into your Barry White. Because <laughs> we know how I feel when Barry White show up. <laughs> our, vo our, time, our time, our way, our, way. Our, power. our power. This is about how do you develop those things so that you become the next level of leadership in your organization. And the women that we have on this panel are some of the most powerful women you will hear from. So show me your piece of paper or your notepad or your remarkable or whatever you gotta take notes on. And I wanna know, look, how many, y'all know, how many of y'all been in church? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. <laughs> Don't laugh, y'all know it's real. Take notes. Neighbor, take notes. All right, ladies, take your seat. <laughs> y'all know we play too much. <laughs> but here's what this is, you all. This is a panel of people, if we were not in front of you all, we would have a glass of wine or a sip of bourbon, and we would be just having a good old conversation. Don't laugh at me, I'm a bourbon girl. Don't hate, don't hate the player, hate the game. Mm -hmm. But we would just be having a glass of wine. Yes and having a conversation. So that's what we're doing this afternoon. We are just letting you in on our girlfriend conversation about how we got to where we are. And we're hoping that along the way, we'll drop some gems and pearls and tips and tools that you will be able to use. So one of the things you need to know is I am a college professor, I'm an adjunct faculty, and I tell all of my students, learning happens when a change in behavior occurs. If there's no change in behavior, you had a very good conversation, you might have had some fun, you might have had a good drink, but you did not learn a thing. And so the goal of today is to give you tools that will cause a change in behavior, because if you come back here next year and you have gotten no further up the ladder to leadership than you were when you were here this time, you did not learn anything. Mm -hmm. All right? So I am Deidre Giles. <laughs> I'm going to be your moderator for this amazing panel. I come to you from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the CEO of a... Come on, ATL! <laughs> Peace up, A-Town down, hey! <laughs> I'm the CEO of a performance optimization consulting firm that goes around the world helping people and companies grow, do, and be better. So on this panel, we're not going to do the boring introduction. Yeah. I'm going to start off <laughs> with our amazing Lori. So here's what y'all need to know about Lori. Y'all, Lori was going to be a rapper. <laughs> don't, la don't laugh like you didn't have a boyfriend that was going to be a rapper, too. <laughs> Truth be told, some of y'all still got boyfriends that's trying to be rappers. <laughs> but this ain't that kind of show. Um, but she had a demo and everything. But I asked this, the panel, what would be your theme song? If you walked into a room, what would the band be behind you playing? And I told them my song was Here I Go by Mystical because who bad enough to meet the alligator in the swamp? Mm -hmm. But Lori said her song would be, I'm Every Woman. Lori, why would that be your song as it relates to leadership development? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. When I was in college, I went to North Carolina Central University. Oh, thank you. And 
I did something I never thought I would do. I ran for Miss NCCU. Ooh, come on now. And at the time, Whitney Houston's song was out, I'm Every Woman. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a campaign and I was trying to tell the students, you need to vote for me because I'm all of these things. I'm the community advocate. I'm gonna have your back. I'm gonna be your ambassador. And that song, even in leadership, We'll talk about that. You wear multiple hats in leadership. So being everything um, and being all you can be. Listen, I told you all. And tell us your organization, Lori, and one of the major things that you all do. Corporate Council Women of Color. Can, can we have our CCWC members stand? We focus on diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. There are a lot of barriers for women lawyers. So we created CCWC 19 years ago to provide a support network to women of color so they can advance. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so important what Lori does because how many of you in your industries, when you walk into the room, you look around and you're like, Bueller, Bueller, mm -hmm. anyone? You walk in the room and you're like, where are we? Where are they? And so you came here and you were like, look, God is real. <laughs> and it's a black woman, right? So we love it. Thank you, Lori. Oh, Londa, I'm coming to you next. So, so far away. <laughs> I know, so, so, so far away, but me and you us <laughs> So, Olanda's funny thing is, she said, I love the smell of books. How many of you can relate? I'm still old school, like I'm on the plane, like I, I'm not putting out a Kindle, I'm like, I'm gonna turn the pages of this book. But you said your song is, My Worship is Real. Tell us why. I'm gonna just tell you the words. It says, you don't know my story, all the things that I've gone through. You don't know my pain and what I had to get through to get here. You'll never understand my praise, so don't try to figure it out because my worship is for real. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it needs an explanation is that you just don't know what someone is going through or what they had to do, what some of y'all had to do to get here, to get your family ready, your kids ready, your spouse ready, your job ready. Some of y'all still getting calls right now from people at work, even though you said you were at a conference. And so you don't know what someone had to go through to get here. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody worshiping or just in tears or celebrating, just praise them anyway, because you don't know what they had to go through. So you'll never understand. And I'm not going to try to make you figure it out. I know this, Trace. I'm going to try to make you figure it out. So tell us about the impact of that song and how that shows up in your leadership at Dell. Number one, shout out to Dell, sponsor this morning. <laughs> yes. It shows up because it's, it's who I am. So when you talk about authenticity, is that I can't leave that little girl that grew up in Church of God in Christ in 1200 Brittanoe Avenue, I can't leave her at the door. She shows up in everything and everything that I do. And so for me, I know we're gonna talk about leadership, but leadership is who you are, it's whose you are. And so for me, it shows up because my purpose is to give back and help to develop the next you your whole you. And so it shows up even when I don't want it to show up, even when I try to make it not show up, it's who you are. And so that, it shows up in everything that I do. And me being here at this time, at the right place, it's where I'm supposed to be. I love it, I love it. So our next person is Mitz, y'all. I promise you, I'm gonna try to get her to laugh for y'all because she has the most amazing laugh. She was like, I laugh too loud. I'm like, girl, that, that laughter is beautiful. It's infectious. Start laughing and everybody will laugh with you. But your funny thing is, she says she can remember just about anything, peoples, places, and things, but don't ask about no movie she watched. She's like, I do not remember the movie nope. at all. And your song is This Girl Is On Fire. Tell, me, tell us why. We are all occupants of this so-called thing, life, which is a race. Whether it's at home or in the workplace, we meet a certain task, we kill it, and our leaders are just talking about the what's next. So, I, I tell my team, take the moment to kind of relish in the fact that we've been successful. Cherish that moment. Take your time. Don't let anybody set the time at ADP. My ADPers out there. We, we just, um, in all business units across ADP, we just completed our Super Bowl, which is our year-end season, and we absolutely crushed it. 
But in typical corporate America, we're like, okay, the what's, what's next and how are you gonna crush it next year? I refuse to, to not talk about our success for 30 or 60 days. I'm like, you are going to sit down and you are gonna hear what we were able to do for our clients for at least two months. Give, give us that. And then we'll talk about how we're gonna to continue to be successful and crush it next year. So just take the time to relish in the moment, right? Time goes by so fast. There's so many things that we're involved in that we're so successful at it. We need to give ourselves credit. We need to give our teams credit. Don't let anyone steal that away from you. So this girl is on fire. I am spending the weekend with 1,600 new friends. This is my first time here. This is amazing. No one can pour uh, soda on my Cheerios. It won't happen. <laughs> won't happen. I love it. She's like, you're not going to mess up my Cheerios. No one can mess up my Cheerios right so now. So you talked, I love that you talked about time because one of yeah. the pieces of the theme is our time. And if you don't know what black women, it's our time. Always. Now. That time keeps ticking, so you can miss the time if you wanna, but it's your time right now. Mm -hmm. So the question is, especially for those of us who are in the room and we're developing leaders, how did you know it was your time? Yeah, so th this is a good question because I think um, you have to decide it's when is your time for frontline leader level, when is your time for that next leader of leaders, when is your time for that senior leader and above, so for me, um, that frontline leader level, I started as an individual contributor at ADP, just really from the bottom up, exploring all things about human capital management, had no idea what it was. Um, and I was just really impressed by what ADP had to offer, the leaders, the training. I knew I wanted to get into leadership from day one. And if I think back um, to my childhood, I was a leader at home. My mom was a single parent. She leaned on me as a middle children. Any middle children in the, in the room? We, we are the best, we are the best, yes. Uh, you know, whether it was in school and teamwork, right, at the university, or whether it was captain of the cheerleading squad or the flag twirling, like whatever I did, I was out in front leading. And I knew that I could do that um, at a higher level. So there was a pivotal moment where I had to really decide did I want to continue to be that technical expert or did I want to explore leadership and really um, t uh, take on or transition from an informal leader to a leader? So it can happen many ways. You can get tapped on the shoulder. Someone can see that in you that you can't see in yourself, um, which, is, which is major uh, and, and a good conversation because a lot of times you have the, you know, the little friend that's telling you what you can't do um, but someone else is gonna tell you what you can do and that you can explore it. And then when you get to that frontline leader level and you're thinking about the what's next, because you should always know the what's next, the elevator speech, you never know who you're gonna run into, CEO, whomever, they're gonna say, so what's next, even though you got the job. Um, you need to explore all leadership opportunities. You need to study people. I think it was mentioned yesterday or, or um, this morning about like where do you want to be and how do you want to be and really carry yourself in that way. I mean, make no mistake, you have to master the role that you're in. That's number one. And you have to be intentional about networking and intentional about your action. But that's going to continue to step forward um, to the additional leadership roles and just take advantage of what it all has to offer, right? It doesn't have to stop at the one level, like keep going. Awesome, so Olanda, I remember when we were talking, one of the things that you said that stuck out to me the most was, when I develop a leader, I develop the whole leader. So we talk about leadership development, we can't leave out finances, we can't leave out health, we can't leave out family. And we talk about doing it your way. Mm -hmm. How did you find that way of developing a leader? For me, like I said, you just can't develop half a person. So when you're developing your leaders, it's important for you to understand what do they want? Where do they wanna go? And not just from their career journey, but we're not all working voluntarily. Like we talk, you know, we wanna get paid. And so to get paid, it's like you gotta move up in your career. So I always try to find out what's your financial goal? What's your long-term goal? What do you wanna do after you turn in your badge and you get done with this corporate life or whatever you do? So that that way, when I'm pouring into the person, whether it's initiatives or figuring out their coaching styles, what do I need to do to get them to their next two, three, four clicks down? And that includes the whole person. 
And I do that based on my mentors and my leaders along the way who really helped me develop as a leader. So for me, one of those notes you need to write in your notebook right now, your phones, however you do it, is you need to diversify your portfolios, whether that's your financial portfolio or your career portfolio. Do you have a diverse resume, experience, exposure, so that when it's time for the next opportunity, you have the tools in your toolkit? So for me personally, I have been in every part of the business that there is. I can sell it, mm -hmm. I can build it, I can deploy it, I can support it, I can financially run it with a P&L because I follow the customer journey. So in my career, I have been in every role from customer facing sales, I've run an engineering department, I just came back from a four year assignment in Penang, Malaysia, running engineering. So I know that when I get a call, I can do anything that the customer needs me to do. So make sure that as you develop your leaders, you're developing them to have a diverse set of tools in their toolkit, but you need to do the same because that way you go from limited opportunities to endless opportunities. And you heard it mentioned today, if you understand what your company goals are, how your company is profitable, then you are more likely to next year when they return have an opportunity to compete for the next level. So diversify your portfolios. And when you're getting paid, make sure you invest it because wealth building in the black community especially is how we ensure that we set up the next generation. It does take money and we need to understand the value of it and how to earn it, get it and invest it. Yeah. I love Just one, it. one quick point, you cannot diversify your portfolio if you continue to live in the comfort zone. Yes. As women, we get in our comfort zone and the years pass by. And meanwhile, everyone else is becoming more well-rounded and moving, including men, and here you are, because you opted to stay in your comfort zone. Right? If you think about Alanda's story and as she transitioned, right, and gaining a p and and different exposure, she was uncomfortable every single time and probably didn't know what she was doing most of the time. But she knew how to network, who to connect with to get the right answers. So live outside of your comfort zone. And I wanna stick with that investment piece a bit because mm -hmm. Lori, this is something that you harped on. When we were talking, one of the things that you said that really st stayed with me was I remember when people were getting their bonuses and some of them were going out and buying franchises with their bonuses. So how you develop outside is as important as, is as powerful as how you develop inside. And so as we think about your power, what's the importance of that outside development that also improves us internally? A great, great question. Um, and I'll build upon what both of my panelists said. You know, we also understand within some of our company structures that we do not have the access to some of the things that will help build our toolkits. You know, women of color, we have all often been denied access to leadership roles because we don't have P&L experience or sales experience or marketing experience. If you're at a company where you have the opportunity to get that, mm -hmm. you are at a great company. But many of us are not at such companies. So it is critical that you be empowered to find and develop those skills outside of your current job. Um, I love what you said about mm -hmm. moving outside of your comfort zone, because when I think about my leadership and how I've been able to develop it, it's been th through things I've never thought about doing. That's right. uh, early in my career, I was uh, working at CBS. I was there for 20 years, but I lived in Harlem, New York, and we didn't like the way the landlord was treating us. So I started a tenants association. Now. When you work with tenants in Harlem, <laughs> you want to talk about building leadership skills, but what was great from that experience is I had to go to door to door. I had to listen to the tenants. I created a newsletter. We had to build consensus. And from that, 
I then created Corporate Council Women of Color, utilizing those same skill sets. And what's great about CCWC in founding your own organization, the only barrier that you have is the barrier you put on yourself. Mm. You don't have to deal with politics or politics, however <laughs> you call it. But externally, I was able to get all of those things you just men mentioned, p and mm -hmm. sales, community, I mean communications. And then as I started to grow as a leader, I was able to catch the eye of senior management at CBS. And the boss that I worked with then was the chief legal officer, Lou Briskman, and he said, you have great organizational skills. You should be doing what you're doing for CCWC for me. So then he brought me in to work with him directly. And you know he asked me to do something called a document retention uh, program. Have you ever heard of document retention? Mm -mm. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I, <laughs> I didn't go to law school to do boxes. And, but anyway, I, a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I went on and did the process. Pro, the uh, program, which I didn't want to do. Any of you see Karate Kid? Yes. Remember when Karate Kid is like, I'm ready to fight. I don't want to wax the car. <laughs> but that whole program was waxing the car. Mm -hmm. I learned that entire company business yeah. by division, by doing that box program. So sometimes you have to go outside to build right. the skill, and then you will catch the attention of the people inside who will utilize you. And let me tell you why going outside is so important. Some of you all need to develop in areas that are not available to you for development within your organization. A great place to do that will be a nonprofit. They don't have a bunch of money to pay a bunch of people. If you want to learn accounting, hey, Boys and Girls Club, I want to do accounting over here. They're like, Psh, come on. Mm -hmm. We don't have the money. And so some of you are begging for development within an organization, and you know they're not going to give you that opportunity. That does not mean the opportunity does not exist. Can it I may exist that? outside, yes. Join your sorority. Join the parent support group. Mm -hmm. Join the nonprofit board. Get the experience. Raise your hand. I'm going to be the president. I'll be the vice president. I'll be the secretary. You will learn so much through those opportunities. Seize them. And so I want to come back to you really quick, Alanda. You talked about doing your stint in Malaysia. Can you talk about the importance of international exposure as it relates to leadership development? Because I think that's something that we don't think about. Mm -hmm. My business grew to a whole nother level when people found out, wait a minute, you're working internationally? Mm -hmm. you, you're over there doing what with who? You might speak a little bit of Espanol. <laughs> <laughs> Hola. <laughs> So talk about the impact on leadership development for those people who have an opportunity to get that international exposure. Take it right away. It will change your life inside out. So I've always had the, the luxury, and you talked about not having organizations. I have to say hashtag Dell, because we really do have the opportunity 130,000 employees, we're in so many countries, we do have the opportunity to grow. And I've always managed international teams. My team today sits in 28 countries. So the exposure is there. Now let me layer something onto you. Imagine getting a call from the US Embassy when you live overseas that, hey, in 24 hours, you're not gonna be able to exit the country because the borders are about to close. So that takes your international experience to a whole new level because I lived in Malaysia during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about getting the exposure, there's the work exposure from how countries do business versus how the US does business, mm -hmm. but then there's a life. And so it made me a better human being. And you talk about your business going to the next level, that toolkit, that exposure, you will have a plethora of opportunities in your inboxes, in your LinkedIn saying, we want you to come work for us because you have exposure. So companies now don't have the luxury of doing business in just one place. All of you have something that you own, have on, or are using that was not developed in this country. Many of us like really nice shiny things, high-end designer clothing. It doesn't say made in the US of A. So for the most part, <laughs> international business, international cultures, it will enhance your toolkit and that portfolio. So if you get the opportunity today to work in anything touching international, 
do it. The laws, the country, the cultures, mm -hmm. it will help enhance you and embrace it. Don't just work internationally, expose yourself and get out there. And you know what? You don't have to wait to do it with work. If you don't have a passport, go get one, get it stamped, and go experience it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get, if you don't have a passport, <laughs> get one immediately. Yes. And get one for your children. Yes. Give your children the gift. For Christmas, if you don't have a gift, give your children the gift of a 98 US dollar passport and take them on a trip, get it stamped, give them exposure. It will change their life. Absolutely. And you may need a quick escape and you might have time to get a passport. <laughs> you got to get away quickly. Um, <laughs> but in the room, we have a mixture of audiences. We have some yes. people who are becoming leaders, and we have people who are leaders, and we have people who are developing leaders. And I want to speak to those who are developing leaders really quickly. One thing that we know is that everyone has a superpower, and everyone also has a kryptonite. And when it comes to developing leaders, I remember when I realized what mine was. Mine was pulling that optimal performance out of people, making I could see what they should be, and I could help them become that. My kryptonite was I would want it more than they wanted it. Mm -hmm. And so I would be crippled by seeing potential and driving for potential that some, because some people do just want to do what they're doing mm -hmm. and that's their right, right? So I want to ask you all, all three of you that same mm -hmm. question. When you think about leadership development and the leaders that are coming behind you that you're developing, what's your leadership development superpower for them? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, what is your kryptonite as a person that's developing leaders? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with you right here. Go ahead, All right, Nick. I'll, I'll start with the kryptonite first because that's the harder one, one to talk about. So right now I have 800 and I don't know, close to 900 people uh, that tree up into me. So a lot of responsibility, a um, lot of times we're uh, really facing off with the president of our, our, our business unit and they're both uh, US, uh, in terms of the teams US and, and international. And I have nine or 10 senior leaders, a few executives and some uh, senior directors. And I also like to win, right? I'm tasked with making the president and the SVP look good. Um, so it's hard for me sometimes when I know they want to take risk because we should be taking risk and we should encourage risk, but I know that the risks are not going to pan out, but I have to remind myself that in some scenarios I have to kind of sit back and allow them to take the risk. That's super, super hard, especially when as a leader I'm going to have to be the one to respond to said risk and if it didn't pan out, right? So that's super hard for me. Um, for those uh, that are leader of leaders or execs, um, you all can, can probably um, relate. So I'm working through it. It's, it's completely new for me. I'm two years into this role. Um, so I, I'm working through it, right? Uh, it's challenging. So my superpower, I love people. I am obsessed with people all people, so I can have a conversation with you, I can tell you what you're gonna say next, I can, you can share part of your experience and I can finish your story, and that normally catches people by surprise because they're surprised at like, how did, how did I know what they were gonna say next, or how did I know what they were truly experiencing, or how did I know what they really wanted to say without even saying it. So um, I love that about myself. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. I'll tell you a quick story. I don't know if we have HR one. I think we have eight ADP HR people in the room. <laughs> so she's I talking was, about her friend that did this, yeah, not yeah, her yeah, though. Yeah. It so was, was her having, friend did was, this. Tell us what your friend a, did, girl. Tell your friend business. There was a quick story about, oh, I was married, my husband was overseas, and he let me know he wanted a divorce. And maybe someone said, well, did he fall in love with a man? And maybe the response was, oh my God, how did you know I've never shared that with anyone? So that said superpower, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> I just study people. <laughs> it's I gonna am, get me in trouble one day. I am no longer talking to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, so I am obsessed with all of you. The whole crowd is like, I will not be talking to her yes. afterwards. <laughs> mm -mm. Get somebody else to do it. <laughs> Yes. All right, you, Lori, tell us what's your superpower, your leadership development superpower, and the juxtapose to that, what is your kryptonite? We, we have over 5,000 members, and I would say that for many women of color, they struggle with that, and you mentioned it, the, the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. of, of not being, not feeling that they are talented enough or good enough, so I think my, my superpower would be an inspirational leader. Mm. Because what I, what I really strive to do as a leader is try to encourage people to be their very best and to bring expert speakers to the event who can serve as examples mm -hmm. and encourage them to not let anything in the past or any errors or any mistakes hold them back. So providing inspiration and being optimistic. I mean, even during the pandemic, I think I was very optimistic, mm -hmm. but people need that. With respect to my kryptonite, you know, and I, and, and I think many people struggle with this too, um, micromanagement, mm -hmm. you know, no one can do it like I do it, right? <laughs> but, you know, I am growing as a leader over time. I have gotten better with the, the micromanagement piece and being able to trust people on my team to take matters over with me. I wanna see a draft, I wanna see a copy. Send me, send me, send me, I'm gonna edit. That's just not for me as a leader as I continue to grow because we're always growing. Um, being able to give that to the team to free me up to focus on the big picture item. So mm -hmm. I'm a work in progress. I, okay. Next year I'll have a better story to tell you about my <laughs> We are all a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So you, Olanda, think about it from the leadership development perspective. As you're developing leaders, what is your superpower? And juxtapose to that, what is that kryptonite? I can't tell you I have a superpower. I think that's one my team would, would have to really tell you. What I can tell you is I know what my brand is. Mm -hmm. um, I know you call me when you want something fixed. So I'm the fixer. So for those scandal fans out there, I am your Olivia Pope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if uh, for all the HGTV people, I'm your Joanna Gaines. Yes, yes. But you call me when you want it maybe burned down, tore up, peel the rug back and say, ooh, you got a big hole there. But you want it fixed. You want it fixed right. You want it fixed profitably and with an exceptional level of excellence. I am the fixer, that's my brand. You call me when you want it fixed. Mm -hmm. As far as my kryptonite, I was born and raised in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, so I am a Buckeye. Um, oh, O-H, all right. Um, so no cults we, in here, we're not we, gonna have no cults up in here. No, no, it's called football. So for those of you who um, follow a little thing called football, I am a coach. I am my next life, maybe I'll be a defensive coach. And as a coach, you leave it all on the field. So my kryptonite is mediocrity. It just does not work for me. Yes. I, there is no room for mediocrity anywhere. And so for me, when, it, when it's mediocre, it, it causes me some challenges. Yes. Um, so if you are going to show up, leave it all on the mm -hmm. field and give it your all because mediocrity just doesn't work yes. for me. Like it's, she's, she's allergic to it, you all. Mm -hmm. does, it don't work. Break don't, out even, in don't even apply <laughs> to work for me, with me, around me, if you are not going to bring a level of excellence That's because right. excellence increases your pay. That's all. Cool. And good leaders know that when my people perform excellently, it reflects well on me. That is right. correct. And I will give you the shine every time. So one of the things that Carla Harris said is she said that proximity breeds familiarity and familiarity breeds support and sponsors. So when we think about the impact of the pandemic, people having to leave the office, go home, 
and not have that proximity. What was the impact of that on leadership development, particularly for black women? And I'll throw that out for all three of you all. When we think about that proximity, because we know proximity bias exists. The closer you are, the more familiar you are, the more familiar you are, you get that sponsorship. So what's the impact of that on black women? And how do we change that? How do we reverse it so that we can get that proximity back, even though we may not be similarly, similarly located? Well, I, I will add that with respect to women of color attorneys, uh, we talked to them last year. Many people f really enjoyed working from home because being at home, they, they were able to realize how, for many, how toxic the work environment was. Mm -hmm. Many people enjoyed the fact that by working from home, it didn't remind them that they were the only one. And then sometimes the dynamic in the workplace, when you're in the workplace, there's always that boss or somebody, they want you to come and sit in their big office, you have a small office, whatever the dynamic is. <laughs> but COVID took all that away. We were all on Zoom, and you know, you didn't have the dynamic of the office space and the cooler talk and the you know, inappropriate comments. So many people enjoyed working from home, but we, we have to remember as women of color, in the workplace, we are already invisible. Working from home magnifies being invisible even more. So we have to get back to the office. Mm -hmm. A lot, you know, many people have gone back. Now, how many people are working from home? Hybrid, okay. So, you know what? A lot of the deals are getting done in the workplace, the people who are there. They bump into each other. Oh, hey, I just got this new project. Why don't, you know, you have to go in the workplace. Mm -hmm. You have to, even if you go two days a week, walk down the hallway, knock on the door. Hey, how are you? You want some coffee? But we, we have to get back in the workplace. I'm very concerned that we're going to miss out on promotional opportunities Great. and growth opportunities by being home behind the computer. I, I will say, too, that for many people, though, we just join the rest of the world who's already remote. And so we can take a lot of good lessons from people who've been remote their whole careers. And you just gotta deliver and get involved. I don't think there's a magic answer because every industry is different. Some of you don't have offices anymore to go into because it was a cost savings initiative to close your building. So you just have to find a way to deliver. Remember what is important to your organization, mm -hmm. to your company. Everyone has a fiscal year that has either started or will start soon. What are the key performance indicators for your company? Figure out what they are, get involved in an initiative that will highlight your name. Even if your face is not seen on a Zoom screen, you need your name to be seen on the screen somewhere or in the room because there is no magic answer and some people don't have the opportunity to go back to a physical building. Those days are over. And so you have to find other mechanisms to be seen, to be heard, but to deliver. That's the most important thing, deliver results. Yeah, and for me, this may be going a little bit off topic because I'm just thinking about the different levels of leaders in the room and when we all had to go home. That wasn't, I myself was not prepared for those that didn't wanna go home. And I became a different type of leader because I failed to realize what others may have been struggling at home. It, it was hard for us to kick those last whatever percentage of associates out. And when you had the conversations with them, it was like, I have, my home is not, not safe for me, right? It's, it's um, you know, I'm in an abusive relationship and coming to the office was my outlet and I'm safe here. So I wasn't, pre that I wasn't prepared for. And it may be, made me become a different type of leader. Like I had to dig deep, because you have to think quick when you're having those conversations. And what do you say, especially if you don't have, well I say we're all in HR as leaders, but if you don't have a traditional right, um, HR training, you have to think really quick. And then the same thing for when we wanted everybody back, because now it's two years later. Now I'm 
taking care of my parents. Now I, I'm, I'm divorced and I'm a single parent and I can't afford childcare and like having those conversations and, and figuring out a way to still be nurturing and empathetic, but then answering to what's expected of you as a leader and what's expected of you to enforce, which was that, I know a lot of people called out hybrid, that hybrid schedule, which was new, right? We had to ask them to come back. And it was all for the better good because like uh, Lori said, it's, it's, you can't get promoted at the rate that you normally would from home and there were many challenges for us from training opportunities and met networking and connecting. It can totally work. Um, I agree with Alanda, but it's going to take work on your part for sure. So first you have to deliver on those results, right? You have to show up, but you have to be intentional about all of the other things and getting involved and figuring out like what else fills your cup. So I, I, I'll speak for myself. Um, I learned a lot just about the, the leader who I was and how I navigated going home, how I navigated coming back to the office. In some cases, we're still doing that, right? Really trying to enforce that three, two. But it, it's not easy, was not easy, right? At all different layers of uh, the organization of leadership. And also, one of the things I tell people is find the sentiment of what was happening in the office. Mm -hmm. There's nothing unique about the office location that made the ability to get promoted there. It was the sentiment of what was happening. So mm -hmm. take that sentiment and put it where you are. One example I told someone, I gave one of my clients this tip, she said, I feel like I'm not being seen because if I was in the office, I could go by their office and we could go and have lunch. And I said, you can still have lunch. Mm -hmm. Find out what they like, order an Uber Eats, set a lunch, mm -hmm. have it delivered at the door when it's time for your meeting and now you're having lunch. Mm -hmm. and no one else is doing that, mm -hmm. right? And so think of ways to create that same sentiment mm -hmm. when you're not in the same location. Mm -hmm. Because it can be done, but it's work, but so is getting promoted in the office. You yeah. haven't found it easy to do that either, right? Yeah. So there's nothing unique about that. So think about the sentiment and think about what works for you mm -hmm. and your organization, because all of these women are speaking about, this is what I know from my organization. And so every organization is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. And so find out what works there. What so, we can't afford to do is to sit at home 100% remote and do nothing besides our day job. Because she challenged us to <laughs> be at that next level last year and we will not, there'll be a limited amount of people in this room that are gonna stand up to say, I'm at that next level, right? So we cannot sit behind the computer, not turn our cameras on, just do our day job and go about our business because we will not continue to accelerate in our careers. So with that, Mitz, I wanna stick with you for a second. Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't mean for that. <laughs> so one of the things I say about yes. mentorship mm -hmm. is that when you're a mentor, your hindsight should be your mentee's foresight. Mm -hmm. If it took you 10 years, it should take your mentee five years oh. if you're truly invested in them as a mentor. So when you think about mentorship and making your hindsight their foresight, mm -hmm. what is the thing you wish someone had said to you when you were in the position of becoming the leader that you are? Yes, I love this so much because all of my conversations, I share all of my experiences. Because I say for once, I've been with ADP for 22 years, right? So I'm, I'm on the longer journey. Um, number one, we can't compare our journey to someone else's journey. It's, it's so vastly different. Um, but as women, we put that on ourselves. At 30, we want to be married with two kids. I'm not married. I'm way over 30. At 40, you want to you check off this box, like whatever it is, right? Everybody's journey is completely different. And some of the learnings for me, a major one, um, and I don't share names, they may or may not be uh, in this room, but I would say probably I was 13, 13 or 14 years into my ADP career and completely crushing it within my team, within the 12 to 14 people that were reporting to me at the time in my business unit, my team, et cetera sitting in New Jersey, which is right next to our corporate headquarters, and I got feedback one day. I think I was applying for a position at the time, and they said, you've been here 14 years, and I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Had all these accolades, right, KPIs and stuff I was crushing, and they said, why don't more people know you? There's no one at the table talking about Mitzabeth as a leader, 
in New Jersey. And here I was, I was heads down coming in, my team was highly engaged, high performing team, completely crushing it, but I focused on nothing else. I had no idea what was happening around me. I had no idea what I needed to continue to fulfill my cup. I knew I loved to serve, but didn't know that I can serve in corporate America outside of the people that were reporting into me. So I share that story all the time because I'm all about, as you said, right, cutting their time when you're, um, when you're mentoring people because you want, you want them to learn from, from your mistakes. So I tell everybody, Number one, you want to crush the job that you're in. In parallel to that, you want to make connections. You want to be intentional about your actions. You want to discover yourself, figure out like, what do you like to do? For me, I like to serve. Well, in what areas do you like to serve? So I had to discover that about myself. And once I did, I was all over the place and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> so. Don't come to me no more. <laughs> Coming right back. <laughs> so I want to jump to you, Lori. When we talk about the landscape of leadership, especially as it relates to black women, how have you seen that change and where do you see it going? Because you really do have your finger on the pulse of what that looks like. Yes, I mean, I've seen a lot of movement uh, po post George Floyd. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you have seen it. Um, with respect to women of color, there are now opportunities for women of color to serve on corporate boards. There's a big push for that. And I think that if we can get women on corporate boards, if, if the women who get on the boards mm -hmm. are leaders without consequence, then we can change a lot of the cultures within corporations. One of the things that I have other concerns too. I'll share them with you, can I? Yes. Okay, so Corporate Council Women of Color for years, we have been fighting for women of color to become chief legal officers, the top lawyers at the company. So over the last maybe five or six years, you know, I'm starting to see that people who started early out with me, they're now moving into these top C-suite roles, but what concerns me is there's a fear. Uh, they get in the job and then you have a situation where you call them and say, you know, we have some interns, would you be interested in getting some summer law interns? No, I can't do that. Okay, do you have any job openings? Can some of our, the lawyers who are looking for jobs, apply for jobs in your department? No, we can't do that. Well, some of the outside counsel they're looking for work to do. Can they handle some of your legal matters? No, we can't do that. Okay, so now we spent all this time fighting for women of color to get in the C-suite, and now they're not helping. Mm -hmm. So I really don't want to see a situation where we end up on the corporate boards. We end up in the C-suite, but we're not helping the pipeline because we will be back to scratch square one where I see things happening. Over 20 years, I've seen uh, people in the C-suite, the top levels, they come, they go. When they go, you don't see them anymore. And then we're starting back over again. Mm -hmm. So we need to be in a situation where those of you who are on the road to leadership, those of you who are in leadership, you have to give back. This is what it's all about. And, and I love that so much because I tell everyone, when people tell me, it's lonely at the top. And I'm like, did you take anybody with you? Because <laughs> my top isn't lonely and I'm determined to take as many people as can go with me. So if you're in my network, if I have a connection, if you say, I want to talk to, let me get on the phone and call because I am not going to be lonely at my top. When I get on my private jet, I want you to have a private jet too. <laughs> and can I add, we can't be in this mindset that one is, one is not enough, but two are too many. Mm. We've got to bring people with us. Absolutely. If we don't, this is all for naught. 
Last one before we open it up for Q&A for you all. I want to end this one with you, Olanda, because you have this great view of holistic leadership development, and you always talk about continuing that development. It doesn't stop just because you get to a certain point. Can you talk about, for the people that are in the room that are at that senior level, how do they continue to develop to get to the C-suite or whatever is next for them? Actually, the, the development gets better with each level because your access gets better. Mm. People are willing to spend more on you um, as, as you climb up and take advantage of it. So I can tell you, I, I'm in technology. So right now it's all around cybersecurity. Like we've been here, what, about 45 minutes maybe mm -hmm. in this room? Mm -hmm. In the past 45 minutes, there's probably been thousands of hacks that have happened since we've been listening um, in this room. Like AI has probably tracked half of the stuff that we've been talking about. <laughs> and it's really interesting. So for me, I'm learning all about cybersecurity and data science and look, I, do I need to? No, but it's something that I enjoy. So I encourage you, never stop learning. Never stop growing. It never stops. I don't care what level you get to, there's always something else. There's always something to be learned and something that you learn from someone. So it doesn't stop. The more you climb, the more knowledge there is for you to gain. That's right. You will never have all the answers, and even if you think you do, you don't. Um, and so don't stop learning, and the access you get is to people, mm -hmm. and that becomes vital. Because you talk about sponsors and mentors to get you there, well, how do you think you're gonna stay there? Mm -hmm. And so that is so important when you get there. I love it, thank you all so much. Thank you, panel. So we're gonna open it up for questions. Now, really quickly, put your hands down real quick. We saw you. <laughs> Before we open up for these questions, ladies, questions end in a question mark. <laughs> if what you said cannot end in a question mark, it is not a question. So when you stand up, say your name, your company, and your question. <laughs> that is with a what? <laughs> All right. Don't go long. All right. So raise your hand on the aisles. We see you over here, right there. And then we have one right here also. Go for it. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much, ladies, for having such a great, candid conversation. My name is Danny Spikes. I'm the CEO of Beloved Box, and I am the leader of my own organization. And so how can I, as a leader, identify other leaders in other organizations that are willing to lend a hand and bring me in? Or how can we begin to have those conversations? What would you recommend? You saw that question mark question? Well, you just, because uh, I'm going, let's go back. Are you just trying to hire people? Is that what you want? Because you got 1,800 people to hire. So what will we? <laughs> no, as a CEO, I have. Look, I'm trying to get y'all leveled up so when y'all come next year, y'all can stand up. That's all. No, as a CEO, I am leadership in my organization. Yeah but there are other organization leaders that I would love to connect with, right? ADP, mm -hmm. Dell, the, <laughs> same shameless plug, Corporate Council Women of Color. <laughs> so how can we as leaders begin to identify that person who can be that other leader? It does, I've learned over the past few hours it doesn't have to only be your organization. And when you're at the top of your organization, uh, who's going to sponsor the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. And so how can we begin to identify other leaders so that we can hold that hand or also be that leader to extend that hand? How do you recommend that? Now, for those who know me know I am not the biggest social media person in the world, but I will tell you, people find me all day on social media, apparently. But you need to leverage technology. I would say at this point, that's going to be your friend. If you're really looking at identifying people and you don't have a network, I would say take it to social media right now and try to do it that way. Because if not, you're gonna to try to do campaigns and networks, but you really do have a group of people to start with. But if you're looking for companies to connect, because I heard you mention a lot of different things, 
I would say social media is gonna be your best friend and doing your homework to identify what company, what's their purpose, what are they looking at sponsoring. All of us have some kind of community goal that we're looking at getting involved in, but you have to do your homework on the company and what are their goals around sustainability and partnership. And that may be for me, one of your easiest ways to get in the door is leverage social media and the access that's already out there from a public forum to at least get started and then go into your campaigns. And, and I would add that if you do some research online, they have organizations where they have retired CEOs. Mm -hmm. They do, if you can connect with them, they can serve as mentors to you as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the only thing I would add is on a personal level, make sure you have a tribe that's outside of your company. And there's 1,600 women here, 1,800 women here. We are your people. So connect and find your tribe here that will help you. That was like a DNA, me and 23, some kind of. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they need to be a sponsor, clearly, because we all could be related. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies. My name is Carla Hello. Duncan. I'm a director of sales for Puma North America, based in Atlanta, Georgia. So peace up. Mm, Atlanta. That's right there. Um, I just wanted to ask, in leadership, how heavily weighted is empathy in your leadership style? Because it's never the goal to really kind of discount or dissolve the human factor in corporate America, especially mm -hmm. as black women, we are nurturers by nature. So what is the balance between I hear you, I see you, and we still have a job to do? Mm -hmm. Great. I love that question. Yeah. I'll actually start off with um, answering that question. I think empathy weighs very heavily, but what we have to recognize is that empathy only works if it's uh, reciprocated. And so when you say, what's the balance between empathy and we have a job to do, you don't have to balance the two. Those two things go together. But as my employee or as a person that's on my team, when you are empathetic to me as a leader that I have a job to do and I'm empathetic to you, it only works in collaboration. So empathy has to have reciprocity. It can't exist just on one side mm -hmm. or the other if it's going to work. And it really starts with trust. Right, the trust in between you and, and the associate or the associate and their leader, right? Because if the trust is solid, they understand you as a leader, you're empathizing, but they also recognize that you, we have work to do and you're being held accountable for certain output, right? So they're gonna do what they can to kind of step up to make you look good. And I would just add, uh, Rhonda Joy McLean has a book called uh, the Little Black Book of Success. And she does talk about empathy and being the woman of color in the office who's listening to everyone's need. And she, she discusses the importance of making sure you draw the line. So she uses the word, don't become the office mammy. Mm. Where everyone is coming to you mm -hmm. as the therapist. And this is what, ha you know what I mean? You have to know what the limits are and cut that off to make sure you're not seen as that as well, because it's gonna tie you up from doing your job. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you ladies so much for the gems that you planted and the seeds of inspiration you planted today. I'm curious, as you think about how you designed your leadership journey with strategy and intentionality, how did you ensure your leadership journey matched the current season that you were in your life? And if it didn't match that season, how did you pivot? I said no I, to certain things. I could tell you earlier in my career, uh, 20 years ago, I had little children and I didn't take roles that would have me on the road. Um, I also made different decisions because when you have to buy Similac and diapers, you kind of make different decisions on roles versus today I probably wouldn't put up with some of that stuff. I'd put the badge on the table versus what I would have done when I was buying Similac and diapers. So I would say for me, I had to figure out what was important to me. And so taking roles where I went on the, wasn't on the road was important. But as time went on, I decided I wasn't going to be your homeroom mom. I wasn't going to be that person there for everything. So I made it to the very important things. And I had to be OK with that decision. And so my decision was always made based on my family and what was going on in their lives. Because that, for me, I wouldn't have been able to balance if I wouldn't have made those decisions. And did it delay my career? Maybe, but it wasn't the right time or the right role for me because I wasn't gonna be on the road and leave my children um, at home. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, I don't know that we talk about it enough, but 
you have to decide what's right for you and when because other people will try to make that decision for you. And I tell my mentees when they come to me, I'm like, you have to put your big girl, did you make, did you decide? Put your big girl panties on, right? And no matter what they come to you with, you've made your decision and stick to your decision and own it. Because when you don't, then you're allowing someone else to make that decision for you and it might not be the right decision for you at the right time. Perfect, thank you. And what is your name and organization you didn't Yes, we didn't. Hello, uh, my name is Monica Simmons and I'm from Walmart and thank you so much for your gems, oh, we appreciate awesome. it. Awesome, perfect, thank you. Next question. This is the last question, ladies, so pressure. Okay. <laughs> this, better be, this better be a good question. Well, <laughs> it is for me. Um, my name is Katrina Wiggins. I'm a manager of benefits at UKG in Alpharetta, Georgia. So I keep hitting a wall and trying to move up. And the question I keep getting asked is, have you had any experience at being a leader of leaders? How do I get past that? You might have to move on. You may not be able to move up. I, mean, I, I tell you, because it's going to be, if that is what's important to your organization, for moving you to the next level and you're not gonna get that opportunity there, you're gonna to have to make that decision. I can tell you, I manage managers and manage managers and manage managers. It's all the same at the end of the day, it's people, right? Managing 80 <laughs> people, 8,000 people is people. Um, and so your org though may not be willing to take that risk on you. And so if you really, the wall you hit, you have to decide, are you willing to keep hitting that wall, getting that same answer over and over again? Are you willing to either move and open up, go to another door that you can get that experience and come back? But you have to make that decision. Or it's gonna be made for you. Yes. Right, and I'll, and I'll just add, you're right. You may have to lead the company. Go get the experience. If you really love the company, leave and then come back with that skill set. So do you feel, with you saying that, so do you feel like that opportunity will exist without that experience elsewhere? Is that what you're saying? Because I feel like the wall is there, right? I, I think because you need to tell the them, listen, I've been here a long time. I want you to meet me halfway. I want you to create a role for me. I want you to give me direct reports of leaders so I can get the experience. They'll probably say no. You need to go leave and go somewhere else where you can get the experience. And, and be ready for and be prepared else? for the answer that you, because sometimes we really don't want the answer to the question that we asking. But you have to be prepared for their response. And if they say no, what are you going to do? <laughs> and then sometimes, lady, you have to realize there are square pegs and round holes. If you are a square peg, stop making the round holes miserable. Mm -hmm. Go where the ground holes are for you. And we have to, that's that comfort zone. Some of us are so comfortable that we're that's making right. everybody else uncomfortable to fit our comfort. No. The writing, you're like, I'm waiting to hear from the Lord. He's spoken. <laughs> so with that said, ladies, learning happens when a change in behavior occurs. If you don't use this information to cause a change in behavior, you just wasted an hour. And time is money, so don't waste your time or your money. My expectation is that next year this time, you would have demonstrated learning and that we will have people standing up and saying, as a result of the gems, we were promoted. I have one more thing for your notebook though, really quick. <laughs> and this is a good one. This is gonna be good because it's important. There's 1,800 of us here. There is something that somebody needs to hear in this room or you need to say, I am not your competition. I am the captain of your cheering section. And we as women leaders need to make sure we say that. I want you to grow. I want you to thrive. I want you to have the Ephesians 3, 20, 21, write it in your book. Mm -hmm. And what it says is he will bless you exceedingly and abundantly above all you can think or ask. And so all of you next year when you come back, what you think you want, he's got something so much better. So as you continue to push each other up and don't pull us down, Mm -hmm. We are going to grow and thrive together prosperly, pro be prosperous and financially wealthy to do so. So I'm not your competition. <laughs> and can, I, right, can I add that? Uh, are, can I just we, add one thing? <laughs> no, no, 
because we will be here all afternoon. They're going to meet y'all right over there in that <laughs> corner, and you can tell them everything you want to tell them. Ladies, thank you all so <laughs> you. much. This was an amazing panel, and enjoy, and meet us right over here to get your extra gems. <laughs> you said, like, meet us over here like we about to... <laughs>